Hi, I'm IELTS with Fiona and for today's podcast I'm also making a video version so you can find it on YouTube and see the things that I'm talking about as I go through my daily tips starting from January. If you need to find them just go to my website ieltsetc.com, click on what's new and that will bring up a daily tip very specifically related to IELTS although there are some just fun things there sometimes and you can follow the tips there and I also give you a summary in my email. So when you click there let's go to the first thing which is on January the 1st and this was a question I got from somebody on Twitter saying do you get extra marks for using contractions and connected speech or weak forms? I talk a lot about using contractions and weak forms in speaking because they are part of natural fluency. So if you look at the IELTS band criteria for pronunciation, it says that you're graded on pronunciation features and the things that I've mentioned, like the contractions, the weak forms, connected speech, they are all pronunciation features. So you have to use natural pronunciation features. Now, the person answered, that sounds like a yes. Personally, I can't really understand how saying fish and chips or should have rather than fish and chips or should have should make any difference. Well, it it does make a huge difference (laughs) because if you say fish and chips, you simply just don't sound very natural. You're pronouncing every word and in fluent speech, nobody pronounces every word. Should have becomes really shoulda, woulda, gonna. Yeah, they are all really important features of connected speech. The examiner doesn't just give you a tick for everything you use. They don't say, ah, that was one contraction, that's one point. That's not how it works. It's all part of your overall performance. And that means once you learn these weak forms and these pronunciation features, you'll include them a lot more naturally in the way that you speak. If you don't, you'll just sound like a robot. So yeah, that is going to make a huge difference to your score if you learn about them. On January the 3rd, I was sent this model essay and it was on Instagram. It had 5,000 views. They've got about 80,000 followers. And the question was about whether the government should take care of disadvantaged people. And I read the first paragraph and I found 10 things wrong with it. And I wonder if you could too. I'm going to read the first line. The first line, it is irrefutable that the uplifting of underprivileged people is one of the most important issues facing us today. And comma, the people reckon that this section of society should be taken more care than the other parts of the society. That's just the first line and every point of that first line is wrong. (laughs) So I just want to make the point that if you're going to use models, make sure they've come from a good and reliable source. If you're not sure, just come and ask me and I, I can help. So the few things that are wrong here is the, the memorization and using a memorized sentence wrongly. So you could say homelessness is one of the most important issues facing us today. That's okay. But you can't say it is irrefutable that the uplifting of underprivileged people is one of the most important issues facing us today. Too many words, overcomplicated, and uplifting is wrong. Irrefutable is probably not the right word. And then there are things like, should the people should be taken more care than is grammatically wrong. Anyway, go and have a look at it and you'll see what I mean. But just be careful about where you get models from. So the next one is January the 4th and it was actually a podcast about marine ecosystems. If you haven't 
read it or listened to my podcast, I would recommend it because this is particularly good for vocabulary. And because of that, I created a special quizlet to review the vocabulary. And that's completely free. I do have lots in my vocabulary course, but there are lots here as well that you can use. And you can click on the link and it takes you there, Marine Ecosystems. And have you ever used Quizlet? I'm sure you have. It's got lots of different things you can do, not just flashcards. But here, for example, we've got endangered species. The synonym gives you another useful word that you can use in IELTS, a species that is in danger of becoming extinct. It's, it's marvellous. You've got the audio. Endangered species. I don't know if you can hear that. Danger of becoming extinct. Okay, so it got the audio. You can star the ones you want to remember. You can use it on the app on your phone. It's marvelous. You can keep your own lists. You can import your own lists. And but there's one specifically for IELTS that reading there for you on January the fourth. Um, January the sixth is a quick tip about labels on graphs. So if you get a graph like this one where you've got amount of food that was consumed, you've got fish, lamb, beef and chicken. And as labels, they have capital letters. You can see that if you just watch the video. And when you write that out, you don't need the capital letters because you're not talking about labels. You're just talking about beef and chicken. So quick tip there. I noticed my students doing it and now they don't. Um, January the 8th was about um, something we started doing in January, which was a, a weekend group writing session where I set the question and everybody writes it in 20 minutes and then I mark it. This one was all about the number of houses built in two cities, Leeds and Cardiff. So this was academic. We do general training as well. This was the academic task. And because it was all about houses, people were trying to find synonyms. And this is always risky. Which one of these do you think are okay as synonyms for houses? We've got homes, habitations, dwellings, residences, abodes, domiciles or domiciles, mansions, apartments, condominiums, edifices and cottages. All of those words uh, my students try to use as synonyms and actually only two of them probably are okay. We've got homes and residences. The other ones are just too formal, a little bit weird or maybe too specific. Be careful with accommodations as well because that's normally uncountable and is not very often used as a synonym for houses. So just be careful, avoid that one. The next day, January the 10th, is my model for this one. So there's a lovely model there with some words highlighted in bold. It's what I do with every model that we use in the academy. And I've, I've shared that with you, lots of examples that you can use, useful expressions. For example, instead of saying from for over 10 years, you could say over a 10 year period or a decade, nice synonyms. You can talk about a seven fold increase if something has increased seven times. Um, you could talk about construction plateaued or stagnated means it didn't change followed a similar upward trajectory that was one of my students who just got a band 8.5 I think that was Fong it's great having students like that so they teach you so much <laughs> he was a data analyst so he was producing these marvelous task one models and finally there was fluctuation instead of saying it fluctuated it's quite nice to give some variety and use there was fluctuation. And I've shared those with you. Those are the examples that my students did in the 20 minutes. And you can see how much we were able to share this good practice, people sharing different ways of expressing the figures. 
Um, January the 11th was just one of the more interesting, uh, maybe more fun posts. It was about words that were banished in 2022 because people find them annoying. And I wanted to know if you say any of these. Number one was people who say, wait, what? To show surprise. Number two was something I use a lot. I say, no worries. Uh, when students contact me or say they're late, I just say, no worries. Um, slightly different from, no, oh no, no problem is a synonym, but people have started using no worries to replace your welcome. When somebody says thank you, they say no worries. And it's a bit controversial, but people object to this. They don't like people telling them not to worry anyway. It's just quite a fun post, quite interesting. And there's a few uh, kind of things that you might use in work. Let's deep dive. I hate that expression. I had a boss who used to say it. Let's drill down. Let's deep dive. Let's circle back. You know, all that kind of jargon that people use about work. What does it mean? Anyway, it's on the banished or banned words for 22, and I'm very happy about that. January 12th was about the verb to meet somebody. Do you meet somebody or do you meet with somebody? I'm not sure if that's an American or British thing, but I never say I met with somebody. I just say I met somebody. Do you say I met with somebody? I just say I met a friend for coffee. Um, it might be British American. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Then January the 14th, a student asked me, is it okay to use the ampersand sign? Ampersand is like a short form for and. You can see it there. You know, like Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They have that symbol. Can you use it an IELTS task too? What do you think? I would say absolutely no, just because it's a short form which is considered lazy for academic writing. Other things that are considered lazy, etc., etc., and so on, e.g., i.e., n.b., don't use any of those in academic writing. What about acronyms? Acronyms are things like, instead of saying the World Health Organization over and over again, you might want to write the WHO, and that's okay, like the BBC. Now, everybody knows the BBC, so I think you don't need to explain what it means. But sometimes, if you think it's not that common, it's better to explain it just once. Put it in brackets, so you're clear, the reader is clear what that abbreviation stands for. And then you can use the abbreviation throughout the rest of your text if you need to. Now the next tip was something strange about abbreviations, strange and interesting. So we said that you could say the WHO. Um, now notice with an abbreviation like that, we don't say the who. It looks like the who, but people don't say that. They say the WHO. Why? I don't know, because the who sounds like a, well, it is a rock band. It just sounds strange. Whereas when you talk about NASA, you don't say N-S-N-A-S-A. -S -S you say NASA. It's a whole word. Now, these two options have some kind of complications when you're when you're using them with an article before them. So if you said I have an MA, meaning a master, masters or a master of arts, an MA, you have to say an A N M A, an MA. I'm going to do an MA. That might be something you talk about in your speaking test. I'm going to do an MA. But if, so that starts with an M, but the vowel sound is E. So <laughs> the first sound is a vowel. 
But if you take something like NASA, a NASA employee, then you don't say an NASA because you're not pronouncing the N like a letter. I hope that makes sense. If you go and look at the post, it might, and you read it carefully by yourself, it might make a bit more sense. I think it's only important when you need that word like M-A, when it's important for what you're going to talk about in your speaking test or your, maybe your job. If you work for NASA, it's important that you say, I'm a NASA employee. <laughs> yeah. So the next one is a collocation issue with raise awareness. So the collocation is raise awareness of something or about something. There's an image of somebody parking on a pavement and because of this they the somebody in a wheelchair a wheelchair user cannot use the pavement and they are forced onto the road now some people are not aware of this problem when they park on the pavement so we need to raise awareness of this problem or we need to make people more aware of this problem. My student said we need to aware more people, but remember, aware is not a verb. So you make somebody aware or you raise awareness. What would you like to raise awareness of? For example, where I live, many people sit outside schools with their engines running and they don't realize that they are polluting their children's school and their children's classmates and I think they just don't realize and we need to raise awareness of this problem. And January the 17th, I think I'll use this as the last one for today, sorry 16th, so this was a question in response to an earlier post, I think the short forms post with ampersand and etc. Somebody said, is it okay to use and so forth instead of and so on? So and so on, as I said, was like a, a lazy way of saying etc. In academic writing, you don't use that kind of expression. Maybe in speaking, yes, but not in writing. So I'm going to say no to and so forth as well because it's considered vague. What does so forth mean? And lazy. Um, in, in task two, you only have 250 words. So they don't expect you to write long lists of examples. So just one list, one example is fine. If people write long lists of examples, it's considered maybe that they are weaker students. Um, for example, somebody says here, smoking is responsible for many illnesses such as cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and so forth. Well, you don't need to list all of those medical problems. You could say, smoking is responsible for many illnesses such as cancer and heart disease. That's all you need. You don't need etc and so on and so forth. But in speaking, it's different. You, you might want to, you might show awareness of your listener and you don't want to give them hundreds of examples. So you say and so on and so forth. It's, it's quite a nice uh, kind of idiomatic expression. And if you go to that post, you can see there's a lovely example on Uglish, my favourite place to find real examples of somebody using and so on and so forth. So just go to the post for January 16th and you'll find it. So I'm going to stop there. Remember, if you need to find these posts, just go to my website ieltsetc.com and click on what's new in the menu in order to find that post and read it for yourself and let me know if you've got any requests or anything you'd like me to post about. 
So thank you very much again for listening. If you haven't already, I'd be really grateful if you could leave me a review or just give me a, a five star review. <laughs> just click the five stars. That's easier. Um, I've, I get about 2000 listeners for every podcast. I haven't got a single review, not one, which is a pity really. I've been doing it for about six years now. It would be really nice. Um, I'd be really grateful. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you next time. And thanks for watching the video too, if you're on YouTube. Bye-bye.